Well, welcome back. Uh, my name is David Kennedy, and I am the former director of the Bill Lane Center for the American West. Uh, Bruce Kane, who you saw earlier, is now the director, but uh, I was very happy to lead that organization for several years. So I'm very happy to see you all here. As Bruce said earlier this morning, this is our third annual State of the West Symposium. We hope that that series will progress ad infinitum into the future. Uh, last week, I had the uh, pleasure of having lunch with uh, Eduardo Medina Mora, the Mexican ambassador to the United States, who was here on campus speaking to a group uh, that uh, formed essentially by uh, students, uh, led especially by uh, Jorge Olarte. Where are you, Jorge? Why don't you, why don't you stand up, take a little recognition. Uh, Jorge is a distinguished Stanford <laughs> graduate, recent graduate who put together this group called uh, FOCUS. Uh, and it is designed, correctly if I've got it wrong, Jorge, to promote a much denser uh, interaction between U.S. and Mexican students with the hope of identifying a future leadership cadre that will understand each other across the national boundary a lot better than we've managed to do in the past. Is that a fair description? Uh, ambassador, uh, the ambassador, the Mexican ambassador, in his remarks that I heard at that luncheon last week, he talked about the need for a new narrative uh, between the United States and Mexico, and by extension, between the United States, Mexico, and Canada. And as I told him at that, on that occasion, it reminded me of a time uh, nearly 20 years ago, just after NAFTA, which is our subject for this panel, uh, came into being, when there was a conference at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., organized by a Santa Fe-based organization, which I think no longer exists, called the North American Institute. And the idea was to bring together educators from the K through 12 and university levels in equal numbers from Canada, U.S., and Mexico to see if we couldn't devise a new continentally scaled narrative to teach young people about their common heritage and future on this North American continent. Uh, I had, to, for whatever reason, I was given the task of trying to make the case from the U.S. side about how there might be at least the foundation stones of some kind of new continental narrative that would transcend the usual national narratives. And I did my best talking about the new world and settler societies. And the best I could do is actually, at the end of the day, a pretty feeble effort. Uh, the Mexican speaker followed me. And he proceeded to read with heat a litany of all the historical grievances that Mexico has <laughs> against the United States. Uh, featuring centrally the United States-Mexican War of the 1840s, in which uh, <laughs> roughly a third of Mexico's sovereign territory was wrested by fire and sword from the uh, uh, sovereign control of Mexico. He even went into sufficient detail to talk about the filibustering expedition of William Walker in Baja, California in the 1850s, complained about the terms of the Gadsden Purchase in 1853, <laughs> Uh, didn't fail to mention the U.S. attack on Veracruz in 1914, uh, John J. Pershing's pursuit of Pancho Villa in 1916-17, dwelled at length on the abuses of the Bracero program and all the bad treatment we're giving in this country to Mexican immigrants today. So then the Canadian speaker got up, <coughs> and he said essentially, well, he said, that's certainly a long list of offenses that Mexico puts in the ledger book against the United States. But he said, I put it to you as a question. He said, is it a gre greater grievance to be periodically abused in the manner we've just heard, or to be chronically ignored for two centuries? <laughs> uh, we have a Canadian speaker here, and maybe he'll have something to say about that. But the fact is that, uh, particularly with reference to the subject of NAFTA, Canada has not been chronically ignored. It, was a ma it is, obviously, a major partner in the uh, NAFTA agreement. And indeed, much of the NAFTA agreement, I believe, is the case. We'll hear from the experts here in a moment. was patterned not in small part on the U.S.-Canada Free Trade Agreement of 1988, and before that, the U.S.-Canada Auto Pact dating to the 1960s. So this panel is entitled uh, NAFTA at 20. Uh, it actually maybe ought to be entitled NAFTA at 21, since the original uh, agreement was inked by the three uh, presidents, George H.W. Bush, Brian Mulroney, Prime Minister of Canada, and Carlos Salinas in San Antonio, Texas in December of 1992. Uh, the treaty was approved by the U.S. Congress, uh, not by overwhelming margins, incidentally, 
and signed by President Clinton in December 1993 and actually went into force in January of 1994. So we're jump, jumping the gun here a little bit. And strictly speaking, this is NAFTA at either 21 or 19, but not quite in full force. That'll be a couple of months from now. And of course, the original agreement uh, in the process of making its way through Congress and eventually being signed by President Clinton, the original agreement also incorporated so-called side agreements on environmental cooperation and labor cooperation. I'm sure we'll hear more about that as the afternoon progresses. But let me just say a little bit about the importance of this matter for the West, which is, after all, the focus of the Bill Lane Center's activity. As of uh, 2010, the last date for which I was able to get reliable uh, data, trade within the North American trade area, the NAFTA area, amounted to $885 billion. The Bay Area alone, a new uh, study incidentally from the Brookings Institution just out last week uh, details this by metropolitan area all over the United States, just how, what kind of a stake we have locality by locality in North American trades. A very, very uh, interesting presentation, and it's very graphically very well done online. But according to that study, as I say, just released last week, uh, the Bay Area uh, is the beneficiary of about $40 billion annually of trade within the NAFTA area. Southern California, including Los Angeles and, Southern Cal and, and San Diego, another $40 billion. And Puget Sound area, my hometown being Seattle, I was interested in this, about $7 billion of trade just within the NAFTA framework. Uh, U.S. direct investment in its two NAFTA partners as of last year was $327 billion, and reciprocally, Canadian and Mexican investment, direct investment in the United States, $237 billion. So this is a major enterprise, and we palpably, measurably benefit from it right here in the Bay Area and in the West in general. Some of you may have seen, those of you who live locally, an article in the San Francisco Chronicle last week about a new uh, carbon emission agreement between the three Pacific Coast states, California, Oregon, Washington, and the province of British Columbia. Uh, and in the course of that article, it pointed out that those three states plus British Columbia have a combined GDP of $2.8 trillion. If we add Mexico to those, this, those three Pacific Coast states and province of uh, 2.8 trillion, at Mexico's GDP is 1.2 trillion. We're already at a number that gives us the fourth largest economy in the world, just those three West Coast states, province of British Columbia and Mexico. Uh, and if we include the other Western states, including conspicuously Texas, uh, we add about another $2 trillion. That adds up to a $6 trillion Western economy, economic region that makes Western Canada, Western U.S. and Mexico the third largest economy in the world. Uh, NAFTA is uh, a big part of that uh, fact of life and as uh, Governor Carstens was saying earlier, recognition of just the scale of significance of this issue to our region I think is absolutely essential to what we're trying to do here today. We're extremely fortunate that we have with us today some of the people who were present at the creation of NAFTA. Uh, our first uh, presenter is Michael Boskin, my longtime colleague here on the Stanford faculty. Uh, his primary home is the economics department, but he also is affiliated with the Hoover Institution, with CEPR here in this building, and with the National Bureau of Economic Research across the road. Uh, Michael uh, took most of his education, all of it that counts, I guess, at UC Berkeley. Uh, he is a world-recognized authority on a range of macroeconomic issues, taxation, budgeting, the impact of technology on the economy. Uh, he's taught at Harvard and Yale in addition to Stanford. And in 18, 1989 to 1993, he was the chair of President George H.W. Bush's Council of Economic Advisors, where he had a principal role to play in the negotiation of the NAFTA Treaty. Our second speaker, I'll introduce them all now, and then they will take the floor, is Jaime Serra from Mexico, a laureate of UNAM and the El Colegio de Mexico, and also Yale University, where he has served since his education there on the Yale Corporation, and Yale honored him some years ago with the Wilbur Cross Medal, which is the highest award that the Yale Graduate School can give to its graduates. He's taught at El Colegio de Mexico and at Stanford and Princeton and NYU, and he has also served as Mexico's Secretary of Finance and the Secretary of Trade and Industry, and he led the Mexican negotiating team uh, in the NAFTA negotiations uh, 20 years ago. 
And our third speaker is John Weeks, uh, who was Canada's chief negotiator for the NAFTA agreement. Uh, he's been Canada's ambassador to the World Trade Organization in the late 1990s. He was before that Canada's ambassador to GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which is the predecessor of WTO in many ways, and a longtime advisor to the Canadian government on trade issues. So we're particularly lucky to have the three, three of the principal actors who brought NAFTA into being with us here today. And I'm going to turn the floor over to them, and I'm sure we have a lot to learn. Thanks. I don't have a clicker, so I think I have to come up here to advance the slides. So it's a pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure to be at CEPR, an institution I have great fondness for, for historical as well as current and likely future reasons. And it's a great honor to be here with my friend Jaime and with John to discuss NAFTA. Um, I had a role in helping get NAFTA started. I did not negotiate it. That was Carla Hills, who was our primary negotiator, uh, who worked with John and Jaime and others. Um, but I do want to do three things briefly. First, I want to bring you back to the period just before the period John sp uh, David spoke about uh, when NAFTA was signed, passed by Congress, and started. Because I think it's helpful to have an idea of what was going on economically and politically at that time to understand the, and in trade to understand the environment in which NAFTA was conceived and negotiated because it was quite a radical idea and faced quite rabid opposition, not just from usual protectionist forces, but from a wide, from a wide array of, uh, of, uh, of perspectives. Uh, second, I want to speak very briefly about the academic um, evaluation, the research on what NAFTA accomplished, including a bit of my own. Uh, and then I'll just hint at uh, some stuff that will go on later in the afternoon, but also hint at uh, the future of NAFTA as we perhaps will be negotiating a Trans-Pacific Partnership and a, a Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership and what role, um, what does that mean for NAFTA. I'll just, I'll tee that up and I will leave corrections and the Mexican and Canadian perspectives to Jaime and to John. Uh, so let me start by where we were at the time. Um, so if you go back to uh, the period in the late 1980s, the U.S. and Canada, I believe it was in 1986, negotiated and then it commenced, I think it was passed on in 87, the U.S.-Canada Free Trade Agreement which itself was controversial, perhaps especially in Canada. Um, George Schultz is with us today. Obviously, a Secretary of State played an important role in that. Uh, back then, bilateral or regional free trade agreements were rare. There was a small European, much smaller European trade agreement at the time. But nowadays, if you go to the World Trade Organization's website, you can see the list of hundreds of trade agreements, such trade agreements. They were unusual at the time. Uh, novel, perhaps, would be a, 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 a useful description. The U.S. had been in a long economic expansion, but we had had a stock market crash and substantially slower growth and fear of recession. And protectionist pressures always mount in weaker economic times. The ambient level's high enough in a boom, but they are much stronger during uh, slow economic times. We were trying to negotiate the Uruguay round of the GATT that eventually was successful and created the World Trade Organization, but had been like the even perhaps a, not as bad as the Doha round is today, but were relatively, negotiates were relatively dormant, stagnating and not going anywhere. So into this environment, um, there was the initiation of the idea of NAFTA. And there were two meetings, I think, that were kind of essential to this. Jaime and I were just comparing notes earlier on. One was a meeting that Jaime had with uh, Carla Hills. I'll let him describe in more detail in Davos. And one uh, was a meeting that I had with President Bush and that, then that Jim Baker and I had with Pepe Cordoba, who was President Salinas' chief of staff. And President Bush was looking for a way in anticipation of meeting with President Salinas, which he was anxious to do. 
um, of doing something positive for our relations with Mexico. And so we discussed the idea at the time, the original idea was maybe taking part of the US-Canada Free Trade Agreement and extending it to, to Mexico. It wasn't the whole thing at the very original idea. And then, then by the time uh, we met with Pepe Cordoba, uh, it became kind of the, uh, the whole enchilada conceptually. Now it's important to understand, for those of you who've never negotiated or read a free trade agreement, uh, the negotiators don't come down from the mountain with tablets that say, let there be free trade. These, these things wind up to be hundreds and thousands of pages long, and there's a lot of detail that goes into them. Um, and I'm, I'm far from an expert on that. I kept an eye on what was going on, but uh, our very able trade negotiator, Carla Hills, who uh, was the person who uh, carried the, uh, the ball for us on that. So the idea got going, um, and from our perspective in America, uh, Brian Mulroney was pretty brave, given what was going on, to, uh, to, to bring Canada into the arrangement. Um, the obstacles were substantial. There's a large protectionist wing in the Democratic Party and a smaller but intense protectionist wing in the Republican Party. So you should never underestimate that. The novelty of it all uh, to coin a technical economic phrase, freaked a lot of people out. <laughs> the idea of the most advanced economy in the world, the largest economy in the world, America was even, was, was more hegemonic, would be a phrase that some of America's uh, economic antagonists would have then. In, 19, in 1990 or 1989, America was a larger share of global GDP and an even larger share of capital markets than it is today when we're still the largest, we were a fifth, we were about a quarter of the world economy then. With uh, a developing economy, even its immediate neighbor to the south, was considered quite radical. There were immediate concerns over two sectors, two very politically sensitive sectors of the economy, manufacturing and agriculture. Manufacturing had been increasing its productivity, it had been hammered with these uh, in the 80s with uh, uh, competition, but had been improving its productivity, but employment had been declining while output had been, uh, had been kept up in manufacturing. And agriculture, there was great fear. Some of it was protection, some of it was illiteracy, some of it was perhaps partially legitimate about, well, how do we make sure that all the stuff flowing across borders is safe? And, Will this, just, will this wreck the rem remnants of our agriculture and our family farms and so on? Um, so there was great concern about this. And importantly, it was widely perceived, including by our own trade uh, negotiators and uh, uh, Carla, who did a fabulous job, but initially she was correctly, in my opinion, concerned about what this would mean for negotiations of the Uruguay round. Would this wind up uh, derailing whatever hope there was of getting it back. So it was a big debate about whether this would be a substitute for multilateral trade liberalization and so on. Uh, and to be honest, in doing the analytical work and the thought, thought about thinking about all this, it was something of a gamble that that would not be uh, uh, damaged. I thought it was more likely it would be helped, it would be spurred on, but uh, there was no uh, way, there was no data, there was no econometric model, there was just judgment and guesswork, and fortunately it worked out. Uh, it's worth mentioning um, that President Clinton ran a fairly brave anchor leg getting this through a Democratic Congress. And I should say another thing that's worth noting is that President George H.W. Bush led this in the United States in a con before a Congress that was overwhelmingly Democratic in the Senate and the House. So, so democratic that there were times it was difficult to sustain a veto. So uh, it was not an easy political environment. Um, and I'm going to leave the others to talk about the concerns that were raised about the, how quickly could we liberalize when finally people got used to the idea. They were sort of thought, well, maybe it would take a, I'm exaggerating for effect here, a century we could phase the thing in, et cetera. Um, there was concern about how we would, uh, um, how we would uh, uh, deal with disputes. And importantly, there was the notion, th uh, two notions that are partly at the heart of protectionism. Somehow the trade is zero sum. If it was good for Mexico, how could it be good for us? 
If it's good for Canada, how could it be good for us? And also, uh, just the notion that we are so much larger, what would this really do for America? And President Bush, I think, saw through very quickly, upon urging from me and, uh, and others, that this would be good for us economically. He, his primary motivation, by the way, was geopolitical as well as economic, perhaps more so than economic. But he very much saw this would be, while it would be on balance, there would be winners and losers, on balance good for America, that it would be more important to the smaller economy uh, having closer ties to the larger economy, smaller economies. So what were some of the results from the academic literature? So that's kind of the environment as we saw it, as we started it, as we had to negotiate it through a difficult uh, period of time. You may remember Ross Perot ran, became a third party candidate and may have cost President George H.W. Bush re-election, some people think. And he often spoke of the giant sucking sound of manufacturing jobs leaving America. So it was not an easy environment. And I think all the political leaders deserve great praise for the courage they showed in pushing forward with a good idea. Um, so U.S. manufacturing exports boomed. Employment and comp hourly compensation went up. Agricultural exports, agricultural exports from America rose to uh, Mexico and Canada, something I have reminded the American Farm Bureau Federation of numerous times since then. <laughs> Trade among the three nations has tripled over this period of time. I'm going to refer to a shorter period of time where NAFTA was responsible almost for a doubling. Mexican wages also rose, rose in the years after the crisis that uh, Augustine referred to. And I'm far from an expert on this. Hopefully you'll get some more information about this later on today. But there was a lot of uh, financial investment in cleaning up the environment along the border. And as I understand it, some of that has at least been partially successful. The academic research on NAFTA, I think, is uh, quite interesting. Uh, there are large trade enhancement effects. I'll give you my own estimates in a moment. And mostly they are a net increase. They are not primarily diversion from other countries. When two countries or three countries sign a free trade agreement, you could see a big expansion of trade among them, but it could just be that that trade is being diverted from their trade with other countries. And hence wouldn't be a large net addition. It would be a small net addition. That might be a good thing anyway, but you have to get, to get an idea of the net benefits to the countries, you'd have to net out the diverted trade. So there are large trade enhancement effects. Gains in real wages from uh, the three countries, largest for Mexico, smallest for the US. Um, and again, NAFTA is ongoing. It's a treaty in force. It's been evolving since then. You know, we've, we've changed how we let trucks in from Mexico and a variety of things that have been high profile. Uh, probably Mexico would like us to do more. We would like them to do more. The same with the Canadians and us and the Mexicans, et cetera. Each country is in the uh, process of uh, liberalizing or trying to liberalize its trade with other parts of the world and has other treaties that it has signed. So it is no longer the case that uh, you can think of NAFTA kind of alone. You have to think of it in combination with the treaties the countries have on or in the process of negotiating elsewhere to see what tariffs in the end, what tariff rules and uh, dispute mechanisms and non-tariff uh, agreements are, are, are binding in the end. Um, just, so two final points. So one is that it's often said that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery and NAFTA has, the people have attempted to uh, replicate NAFTA elsewhere. One that I know quite a bit about is the South Asian Free Trade Agreement, SAFTA. Okay, it's an original name, kind of like the Amero and the Euro. Um, and this is a free trade agreement among India, Pakistan, the Maldives, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Bhutan, and Nepal. And if you think the US, Canada, and Mexico have a lot of differences <laughs> uh, and have, as David was saying, some history to deal with, at least it was mostly an ancient history, um, uh, this was a big issue in, in SAFTA. And what has happened is uh, it's been too difficult. SAFTA has languished. There's been uh, modest tariff reduction. There's still large numbers of goods that are not allowed to be traded. 
Uh, and so what has happened is India has gone ahead and signed free trade agreements with Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. So the SAFT agreements are no longer binding on those. Their, F, their bilateral FTAs are binding on them. They're more liberal. And the Pakistanis are sitting out in the cold, trading about 2%, exporting about 2% to India of what a basic economic model would tell you they should. They actually export a lot more to Bangladesh, which is further away and much smaller than they do to India. So there's some movement on that, on that front, but NAF, people have tried to imitate NAFTA, and it may be the idea is terrific, but it's certainly the political and economic institutions around it will affect this uh, relationship. So I just want to give you, I promise I won't make you understand the math here, but um, I've done my own estimates of what the eff effect of NAFTA are with one of, my, uh, one of my star undergraduates who won an honors thesis for this. Um, and the basic idea that uh, economic theory tells us is that trade between two countries will form, will, will be a, a function that looks like Newton's gravity model. It'll be, a, it'll be an increasing function of the product of the two countries' incomes or GDP, and a decreasing function of the distance between them, a proxy for trade costs. This is called the gravity model and with great originality. So people will go out and estimate these things. I've done this on data from the 70s to quite recently for hundreds of countries and many thousands of bilateral trade flows, et cetera, and with uh, a lot of econometric detail. And it turns out that in most of these things, the trade elasticity is around one. Um, the, the distance elasticity, which is a proxy for cost, is uh, a little less than one. But when you put in uh, effects of bilateral trade agreements, uh, NAFTA has the largest effect of any of the, tr of the bilateral regional free trade agreements uh, in the world today. And if you go back and run this on the period before NAFTA and, the, say, the five or ten years before NAFTA and immediately after, and try to isolate just the change from NAFTA, because you're controlling distance, obviously, doesn't change, but you're, control, you're controlling for the GDPs, NAFTA increased trade in, in the short run aftermath, conditional on the economic improvement in the country, the growth in the countries. So by itself, by 84 percent, it almost doubled trade among the three countries. And that is quite a startling achievement. So I think while undoubtedly there are things that can be improved and there are lessons for the future, um, I think it's a great success. At Hoover, we're going to have an all-day conference on the 20th anniversary of NAFTA on December 9th. Jaime is going to be here, and George is going to participate, and John Taylor, Carla will be there, and a variety of others. Uh, so if any of you have a deep interest in this, let me know, and perhaps we'll be able to arrange for you to attend. So thank you very much. Appreciate the attention. Thank you. Do we have to do some technical work here? Thank you very much for the invitation. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, in passing, uh, Professor Kennedy said that I was teaching here, and you know I have, I'm a bit embarrassed to say that I was teaching here in '82, uh, many many years ago. Lovely press, uh, year for me. I enjoyed the, the, the Stanford campus tremendously. It was great to be here. So in a way, it's very funny that after 30 years, I'm back here. Uh, to talk about uh, this issue of NAFTA, which was not in my mind at all when I was teaching here at Stanford. Uh, and uh, Chairman Kennedy has asked me to, to explain to you in 10 minutes what has happened with NAFTA in 20 years, both the effects on Mexico and in NAFTA, in the NAFTA region, and then to talk also in 10, in not another 10 minutes, within the same 10 minutes, about the future of NAFTA. So the only solution I found is that, um, that I prepare a little presentation to make it more sort of clear and transparent. And for that, just look at the title. The title is Market Ahead of Policy, and probably for this, uh, for this audience this is relevant. 
I'm going to prove the point, and I'm going to try to prove the point, that NAFTA has been evolving the way it has, and all these successes that Michael was referring to, in spite of policy, not because of policy. In spite of uh, the three leaderships in Mexico, the U.S., and Canada, who have pretty much forgotten about it, or that, that complaint that the Canadians had that, you know, you want to be ignored for, for two centuries. I think that NAFTA, in a way, has been ignored, and not only that, has been criticized in a way that is quite shocking. Previous elections, uh, when Hillary and, uh, and Obama were uh, competing for the presidency, they spent some time uh, criticizing and bashing NAFTA and saying that if they were to arrive to power, they would get rid of, the, of NAFTA and so on. In spite of all those things, NAFTA has worked. So just imagine how much it would be working if we had had three leaders in the region that were pushing for NAFTA. And uh, so let me, let me say three things about the effects on Mexico, which is the first part. The first thing is that Mexico used to be a very closed economy. Even, even, even though we were right next to the U.S., our economy was very close. Probably the best example of how close and how politicians and policymakers in Mexico were against free trade comes from the fact that Mexico joined the GATT 40 years after it was created. So it took us Mexicans to join the GATT 40 years. Uh, Brazil, which is a much more protectionist country nowadays than Mexico is, was one of the founders. India was one of the founders, and it took us 40 years to join. So this puts you a bit in perspective of the attitude of Mexico about joining the rest of the world. And then what happened was that we created an anti-export activity in Mexico because we were protecting so much, we were not competitive. And the very first graph that you have here to your left is that as, as we have been lowering our tariffs as a country, among other things because of NAFTA, our exports have been growing. So when you open the economy, as this is a textbook example, you become more competitive and you're able to export. And that's exactly what has happened to, to, to Mexico in the last 20 or so years. And a good chunk of it is explained by the, the existence of NAFTA. The, 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 the relationship between lowering tariffs and exporting more is not a natural one. In Mexico, they say, no, if you lower tariffs, you're going to import more, not export more. And what I used to try to convince these people is, is if you have the ability to import, then you can export because you are competitive vis-a-vis -vis other countries that are open up to markets and so on. And that's exactly what happened. And it's easier said than done now, but 20 years ago when we were promoting NAFTA and trade liberalization, we were criticized as, you know, you not, only, you don't, you not, not the Mexicans only gave California and Texas, and I don't mind that, by the way, but uh, to the U.S., but now you want to give the, the rest of the country to the U.S. because you want just to open up for the gringos to come and flood us. And, you know, it was a difficult debate and complicated debate in Mexico, but I think the, 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 the profound analysis of, of trade ended up dominating the debate. The second effect is that thanks to NAFTA and other measures that we took, Mexican exports have been growing increasingly in almost exponential way, and you see that in the second graph to the right. The blue line is how Mexican exports have been growing in that period of time, which I think starts in 93, the year before NAFTA, and how the rest of the world exports, total world exports have been growing. And you can see that Mexico has a huge gap above, above the, 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 the trend, the world trend. Because indeed, starting in 94, and because of Euro, the Euro round and many other agreements, exports in the world, like the, with the red line, have been growing, no doubt. And trade has been growing worldwide. But the Mexican exports have been growing substantially more. And doing econometric work like Michael has done, it is very clear that it was basically due to NAFTA. And then the third one, and this brings me to the origin of NAFTA and, and make an observation to Michael's comments, is that we were receiving very little foreign direct investment as a country. And as soon as we signed NAFTA, foreign direct investment into the country flew, I mean, came in big time. And you can see that before we were, before NAFTA, we were averaging $9 billion per year, and after NAFTA, we're now close to, I think it's 20, $22, $23 billion. So the two things that NAFTA wanted to do for Mexico happened. One, to export more, and two, to receive more foreign direct investment that we needed because we didn't have enough capital to finance our growth. And this very last thing is actually what triggered my first encounter with Carla Hills. Because we, we went with the president to Davos to say, you know, look at us, we, we are guys that 
were educated in the U.S. President Salinas went to, to Harvard, nobody's perfect. Uh, <laughs> the, the members of the cabinet had gone to study to the U.S. And you know, said, so we're going to convince all these guys. It just happened that a few weeks before, the wall in Berlin had been knocked down. So nobody cared about Mexico. We were there to promote and say, come and, and, and invest in Mexico. They, nobody cared. You know, they couldn't even listen. The room was half empty and so on. So we got together that night with the president, and he said, yeah, this is not working, he said. I said, no. And, he, and I said, you know, tomorrow I'm, I'm having a meeting with Carla Hills to discuss textile uh, quotas. We had agreed to meet in, 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 uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Davos. And I could, you know, suggest to her if we want, that we like to ne negotiate a free trade agreement with them and with Canada. And uh, he said, well, why don't you just ask him? So we went to the meeting. I saw Carla and I said, La Carla, I don't want to talk about textiles. Let's have our deputies talk about that. And a wonderful guy from the U.S. called Ron Sorini and my deputy, Arminio Blanco, they, they went to a different room to talk about the quotas. And I told Carla, Carla, the president asked me, that you tell your president that we want to have a free trade agreement. And she said, yes, but I mean, we need to, uh, come on, I mean, what, what are you talking about? I said, no, you, why don't you tell President Bush that we want to have a free trade agreement? I said, are you sure? I said, yes, let's do it. I said, well, I'm going to have to talk to him. I said, well, that's exactly what I'm asking for. <laughs> talk, talk to him and, uh, and see. And that's how I'm sure, I, I assume and I, I, and I think that those things are compatible with Michael's uh, meetings with President Bush, who, who was in favor of NAFTA or an integration before even that event. But Mexico had been a bit defensive on that front. And that's how it started. And the reason is that we wanted to be back into the foreign direct investment map. So if I, if I were to summarize in these three graphs, is Mexico grew in, term of, in terms of export flows and received more foreign direct investment, which has been very beneficial for the country. Now, let me tell you the effects on the region. And this first set of slides have to do with what uh, our governor of the Central Bank was mentioning. But we have experienced a very remarkable com macroeconomic convergence. That is, when I used to tour the US and Canada 20 years ago, trying to do some consensus building for NAFTA, I would say, if I could, if I could have said, you know, one day in, in two, 2013, I'm going to be at Stanford. I'm going, to, I'm going to show a graph that shows that inflation in Mexico is a bit lower than the US. They would have said, this guy went crazy, right? <laughs> and that's what I used to say. I said, well, you know, things are going to have to converge. And nobody really believed me. Now what happened, is, if you see there, when you look at interest rates, they have converged. When you look at inflation, it has converged. And when you look at the volatility of the exchange rate, between Canada, Mexican peso and the, and the US dollar and the Canadian dollar and the US dollar, they have been very similar. So we have achieved some very interesting stability in the region, including Mexico, which was not a sort of thing for granted. With people and, and, and leaders like uh, our governor, we have been able to achieve, achieve stability. And you see a clear convergence of the, the sort of short-term variables that I think is a very important element for the, the development of NAFTA. The other thing is what has happened in terms of economic integration, and Mike Boskin was already referring to that. But let me just show you uh, an index that I prepared. That is a, graph number seven. I, I put an index there that starts in 1988, a few years before NAFTA, of uh, all the growth of uh, trade flows and foreign direct investment in North America. And you can see that it goes up, and there are two hiccups there. The one in 2001 is China joining the WTO which, you know, diverted some trade. And the second hiccup, hiccup is, uh, is uh, Lehman Brothers crisis. Now, if you were to eliminate those two funny things, this is an exponential growth of trade and investment between the three countries in, uh, in, in North America. But probably the most important part of our, of our integration is that for every dollar that Mexico exports to the U.S., the producer in Mexico uses 40 cents of American inputs. That is, we, to produce this microphone and, and send it to the U.S., 40% of the cost of this microphone is inputs produced in the U.S., which is very different from what happens to China, for instance. 
or to the TPP countries. For every dollar that, that the Chinese export to the U.S., four cents are American inputs. So it's a huge difference. The, the, the ones to the left, Canada and Mexico, and then the average for NAFTA, says that uh, at least 30 plus percent of things that, Mex that Canada and Mexico export to the U.S. are, in, are, in, are products that, that incorporate 32 percent of their inputs, of, of U.S. inputs in their exports. So what happens when you compare NAFTA with other countries is that in NAFTA not only we're selling things to each other, but we're starting to produce things together. And there is a huge difference vis-a-vis -vis the pure outsourcing we have with China or with other TPP countries. And I, I mention this because if, if the U.S. government was to start a policy, which I will refer, in taking into account NAFTA, they, they should keep this in mind, that uh, the relationship between Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. is very different from the relationship that, make, that the U.S. has with China, with the TPP countries, some other Asian countries. And then finally, in terms of, of integration, look at the correlation that exists in, in the industrial production cycles in the U.S. and Mexico, and you'll see that after NAFTA, it's almost 100 percent. I mean, the best proxy for our growth on manufacturing is the growth of manufacturing in the U.S. So this level of integration that NAFTA has achieved basically is the result of uh, a market-driven activity. Because regardless of uh, Jimmy Hoffa not wanting Mexican trucks to enter into, which, by the way, I don't know where, where Jimmy Hoffa is now, but uh, uh, but clearly, you know, the, the transportation issue was always a complication. The Americans, and I say with this with all due respect, never fulfilled their com commitments on, on transportation, which is a real pain for us. Hopefully they will soon. But nobody takes, you know, nobody takes the, all this stuff seriously in the leadership of, of, of the three countries. In spite of that, we have been integrating in, in, an, in quite impressive way. We're changing from a pure outsourcing mechanism through the maquilas and so on, into a much more production sharing mechanism both with Canada and with the U.S. And we have cycle coordination. So there is an a very serious integration in NAFTA that is taking place, again, in spite of policy and politics. Now, let me go to what I think are the future issues and where, where the U.S., but also Canada and Mexico, but particularly the U.S., has a chance to do a policy. And I, I enjoyed Mr. Schultz's uh, ar uh, article a few weeks ago talking about the potential uh, competitiveness of the global, I think it was called the global, par uh, the global player, NAFTA global player. Wonderful article, uh, Secretary, uh, Secretary. But my, my, my observation is that there are some real opportunities now to turn around and say now policy could do something for, for NAFTA now. After 10 years, it might be sort of sinking in, in Washington. The first one is a huge challenge that we're going to face in the architecture of NAFTA, because the Americans are now basically the leaders of the negotiation with the TPP, which is the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is, I understand that the, the, the motivation and the sort of the, the rationale behind that negotiation is more a China policy than a free trade policy, but it's okay. Mexico and Canada have joined those negotiations, but at this point we're at the, at the risk of introducing some noise to NAFTA with this negotiation, unless the three countries negotiate and coordinate among themselves how the architecture of NAFTA is going to stay vis a vis the TPP. My suggestion, but I think that it's a bit uh, utopic, a, a bit of a utopic, uh, uh, idealistic idea, would be that we keep all the NAFTA rules for all those products that move within the NAFTA region. But I don't think we're going to achieve that. And I don't think that the USTR, the, the trade representative in, the, in Washington, is fully aware of the consequences on the architecture. So this is a big challenge. And if we are able to communicate to the government, I think they could do something interesting. And the second one is the, the negotiation with Europe. We, Mexico, we have a free trade agreement with Europe. The Canadians have a free trade I mean, agreement with Europe. You, you just finished the negotiations, right, John? And, and now the U.S. is starting negotiations with Europe. The ideal thing, in my view, would have been to have a negotiation of NAFTA vis-a-vis -vis Europe, two regions, would simplify things enormously, would increase the size of the markets, would get rid of many of the rules of origin that are truly uh, real hurdles to trade, but I, I don't see that, uh, that frame of mind 
in, in, uh, in the U.S. government yet. And I think we need to work on that. And I think uh, Mr. Schultz's article really was very compelling about doing something of that sort. The second issue that is policy oriented is the energy, and we will have a session in the, in, in, after this. But if you look at the, the main point I make in the energy integration of NAFTA is that North America, Canada, the U.S., and Mexico have a tremendous opportunity to be very competitive because the gas, the price of gas after the Shell discovery in, 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 in North America, the Henry Hub price, is much lower than what happens in, in Asia or in, in, uh, or in uh, Europe. So there is a huge opportunity here to increase the competitiveness of NAFTA through a very important advantage, which will last for several years, as we, I think, will hear from the energy experts today, uh, that there will be an advantage that will last for several years and will give us an extra competitive edge vis-a-vis -vis China or Asia and vis-a-vis -vis the Europeans. And I don't see either a great deal of discussion on how to converge there. In this particular case, the issues of policy are not in the U.S., are more in Mexico. Our, our uh, trade, ref I mean, our energy reform in Mexico has to be such that we're able to integrate the region in terms of energy to be uh, more competitive and to take advantage of this particular price that is, you know, substantially lower than the rest of the regions. And the third one that I think is a policy issue, I call it labor mobility because I know that immigration issues are almost a bad word in the U.S. After looking at this issue, I'm not an expert on this issue, but after I look into this issue, it's incredible how myopic the countries have been on this. First, there is a very basic principle in markets that say if you make the, the entry into a market difficult, you make the exit to that market very difficult. So if a Mexican has to go through huge risks to enter into the U.S. market to work and produce and be productive and be able to get some money to send back to their family, if he, if he or she have a hard time entering, they will stay because they made it and they don't want to risk again to go back to Mexico and then try again. If things were much more liberal, I think that we could gain competitiveness in the region big time. And just look at how, how the NAFTA population looks like. There's the first graph, and the green is what Mexico provides as a, as a demographic pyramid. And you'll see that it's much nicer than the one in China or than the one in Canada and, 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 and the U.S. The base of our pyramid for NAFTA is much younger and wider than the Chinese, for instance. The Chinese have a very complicated demographic pyramid because of their one-child policy, and, uh, and they are getting old very quickly. If we were to join through labor mobility uh, in the region, I think that that would be, provide a competitive advantage that is very relevant for the region vis-a-vis -vis other regions. And not only that, but I think that it would finish with some of the problems by distinguishing between, between what is the, the stock of migrants in the U.S. from the flow of workers in the U.S. Today, the, what I see in the discussion of the, of the immigration is basically, and is right, to take care of the 12 million Mexicans that are in this country illegally. But then next, you have to address what's going to happen to other 12 million that are going to come in. And if you, if you change your approach to that and say, listen, take care of the, of the stock issue, legalize them, ask them to be responsible, and so on, take advantage as you are of their productivity, and then have something to do with labor mobility in the future. And that policy has to change, in my opinion, dramatically through visiting working programs or workers' programs where Mexicans can come to the U.S., contribute to the productivity and the competitiveness of the U.S., and then buy a refrigerator or buy a house for their mom back in their little town in Mexico. If we were to approach this in a more rational way through labor mobility, I think that the region could gain tremendous degrees of competitiveness in the years to come. So I just finished. NAFTA function in spite of policy and politics for the first 20 years. Of course, the main policy event was the original event, and that was a huge policy decision very courageous of our three leaders in, in the U.S., Mexico, and Canada. But during 20 years, you know, you, we, have see, we have seen much more NAFTA bashing than NAFTA supporting. And, you know, in spite of that, the integration is happening. The, the region is becoming more competitive. And now the three countries have an opportunity to do a new step, a new quantum leap with the right policy decisions. One, on the architecture of NAFTA. Two, 
on labor mobility, and three on energy integration. Thank you very much. It's on? Okay, good. Actually, I want my second slide first. Okay. I've changed my mind. <laughs> the advantage of going third is you have to be adaptable. Second slide. There we are. Um, well, just to pick up where Jaime left off, and it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I thought it's useful to look at this um, graph, and this, this was uh, first put out at a conference about two weeks ago. Uh, it's part of a larger survey on attitudes in the three North American countries towards different aspects of trade. But I thought it's quite interesting in terms of what Jaime was just saying about why haven't we given more political attention to NAFTA over the last 20 years and why don't we do so now? And I mean, this is quite remarkable. If you'd asked me before I looked at this was support for NAFTA at the 65% level in the United States, I don't think I would have said yes. So it kind of, to me anyway, raises, and look, 80% in Canada, that's quite remarkable. 74% in Mexico. I think it really raises the question, you know, do, do we need to keep NAFTA in the closet as a sort of dirty word that we don't, we don't really talk about? Um, something else I was asked to talk about today is how did Canada get into NAFTA and why did we decide to do that? And this graph is quite useful for that purpose too. Because um, in, uh, and, and, and let, me, let me tell an anecdote too because this is, this is quite interesting. As you heard in my introduction, I was ambassador to GATT during the Uruguay round. And in 1990, when we were working up to an important meeting in Brussels that was supposed to bring the negotiations to a conclusion, Jaime Serra invited a, a small group of ministers to Puerto Vallarta in Easter of that year to try and get ready to have a real breakthrough and, and have a successful result in, in, uh, in Brussels. Well, I was, uh, came with our minister and our minister went on to Mexico to have a bilateral uh, visit afterwards, John Crosby. And I remember sitting beside him at a press conference in Mexico when he was asked by a journalist as to, you know, there's a lot of talk going on now about the launch of free trade negotiations between Mexico and the United States. And he was asked, would Canada be interested in getting involved in those negotiations? And he said, you know, he said, I've been a free trader all my life, but I can't envisage any circumstance under which Canada would become engaged in those negotiations. So I'm based in Geneva. I thought that sounds pretty definitive. And I went back to Geneva and 10 months later, I was brought back to Ottawa as the chief negotiator for the NAFTA. Now, I think what happened there is, first of all, I think Mr. Crosby was being a little cautious because until you have your ducks lined up, you don't want to say that you're thinking about doing something. But there were some serious discussions in the Canadian cabinet about what we should do. And of course, when you look at tracking support for free trade, you know, it started off pretty popular when we were planning the FTA with the United States, started declining and reached a low in in, in 1992, which was when NAFTA came to a hit. So you can understand why some people in Canada thought, you know, we'd had the FTA, we were implementing it in the midst of a recession, which wasn't the best time to be doing that. And, um, and, and, and on public opinion surveys, clearly it was an unpopular uh, political exercise. But basically the cabinet decided, and I don't think there was any real question about it once they really thought through the issues, that if Mexico and the United States were negotiating an agreement, then Canada had to be there at the table. Uh, and in the back of their mind were some defensive reasons, I suppose, that, you know, what if Mexico negotiates a better agreement than Canada and has preferential access to the United States? This is the sort of dynamic of competitive liberalization that we see so prominently displayed today in all of these various trade agreements. Um, the, um, a lot has been said already about the uh, historical significance of NAFTA and, and the economic effects of it. So I'm not going to say too much about that, but I, I, will, I would say something else about NAFTA. From a structural point of view, it's, it has been very important as a trade agreement because 
The NAFTA was the first agreement of a bilateral kind, or a multilateral kind actually at that point, that covered issues like investment, services, intellectual property, and brought them together, and has really become the template for all of the important trade agreements that have been negotiated since. Um, from a Canada-Mexico point of view, the agreement has had quite significant effects. Now, obviously, they're not as big as those you get by measuring either what happened between Canada and the US or Mexico and the US. But nonetheless, we've um, increased our bilateral trade by over 700% since 1993, which is not a bad achievement, an annual average rate of more than 12%. Um, Mexico is Canada's fifth largest export and Canada is Mexico's third largest export market. So those are pretty significant and every time I'm doing some detailed work on trade statistics it's quite interesting looking at Canadian statistics. Mexico will pop up somewhere there in the top five. It doesn't seem to matter what product you're looking at. There they are. And we've also seen a lot of Canadian investment in Mexico which may even be be more significant and is suggestive of, of what uh, Jaime was talking about, of how we are making things together. And you can get various takes on this. The, um, the uh, Ministry of the Economy in Mexico said that in March of this year, 3,225 firms in Mexico are registered as having Canadian capital. Now, I think they're probably about 500 firms that are really active in Mexico, but they include some, some uh, very big ones, um, like Magna, the auto parts uh, manufacturer, which has a number of factories in Mexico, like uh, Bombardier, the aircraft manufacturer, the Bank of Nova Scotia. So there's some, some very big, uh, sophisticated companies that, that have um, invested in that market. And we don't seem to have, at least I don't have sales uh, in, uh, statistics to show what are the sales of those sorts of affiliates of Canadian companies that are operating in Mexico because often this we see now in in, uh, in the modern economy that the sales of foreign affiliates of um, parent companies are actually uh, selling a lot more domestically than is actually crossing the border by way of international trade. Could I have my next slide? The, um, just this morning I was thinking for purposes of this, I would look up some WTO statistics. Don't let your eyes glaze over too much. And I thought from a United States point of view, um, who are your, according to the WTO, this is for trade and goods, who are your top five, it's not on this slide, this will come later, so don't, who are the top five destinations for your exports? in 2012? Well, the top one is Canada at $292 billion. Number two is the European Union, the whole European Union as a group at 266. And third is Mexico at 216. Then comes China at 111 and Japan at 70. So, if you look at this by sort of broad, in broad terms by region, the United States sells to North America, which means Canada and Mexico combined, $509 billion a year. To Asia, all of Asia, 422. And to Europe, 313. Now, if you look at the uh, the import statistics are less heavily weighted, but I, I think that really tells quite an interesting story about uh, what's going on. And when you and when you add to that the point that Jaime Sarah made a few moments ago about the American content uh, in goods being shipped from the North American countries back into the United States, uh, another figure is that uh, I think 70 percent of all the um, U.S. content being re-imported into the United States and foreign goods comes from Canada and Mexico. So it shows this integrated nature of these supply chains. And I think this, is, this, is some, this, this demonstrates the economic effect of NAFTA, how important NAFTA has been economically in getting companies to decide to do business differently and to integrate in this fashion. 
But at the same time, we've had this real political reluctance to, to acknowledge this, to, 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 to tout this as an advantage, as an achievement. And I think this is affecting how we look at the management of our participation together in these new trade agreements, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, the TPP, and the TTIP, the Trans-Atlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. And um, something, and, and I, I picked uh, this slide, which I thought was quite interesting. I found it in, the, uh, in a Congressional Research Service document. And it shows, and I've given it the somewhat aggressive title of, uh, for the US TPP is mostly NAFTA. Now, I know there are a lot of opportunities in terms of what's out there in the Pacific region that aren't accounted for by this graph. And of course, to the extent that US objectives are, as Jaime said, related to how do you really deal with China in a long-term game plan, it doesn't deal with that either. But in terms of the immediate effects, we're talking about negotiating a Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement now that covers all the same subject matter as NAFTA. And then a few additional things. The provisions in the TPP agreement, if we conclude one, are going to be probably in a number of places different from those in the NAFTA. In some places they may add to the NAFTA, in some places they may be conflicting with the NAFTA disciplines. And I think that's something that we in North America should really be thinking about that very carefully, particularly when you look at the extent to which the immediate impacts of what we put in a TPP are going to be felt inside North America, not across the Pacific. So, um, and, um, and I think a lot of the same considerations can apply when you look at the uh, TTIP. Now, as Jaime said, um, Mexico was first in negotiating a, a free trade agreement with the European Union. Uh, Canada has just completed uh, what's called an agreement in principle. Some of the final details are still being worked out, but basically the deal is there. And it's, um, and it's one that is, is, is pretty significant. And I was struck by reading, coming here on the plane yesterday, an article from Inside US Trade talking about what are some of the issues in the negotiations between the US and the EU on the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. And it was very interesting because it was talking about, you know, how, what they're negotiating, where the problems are, how does this relate to what was already included now in the Canadian agreement with the European Union, and how does that relate to what was in NAFTA, and, and, and sort of weighing these things from that perspective. So if the journalists are analyzing it this way, I think it's probably a good idea for the, the trade policy people to do so as well. Now, of course, you can talk about it uh, at a level of generality and it doesn't mean very much, but you know, when you get down to the specifics, for instance, of the rules of origin, how are the rules of origin issues going to be treated in this? That can have a very big Im impact. <clears throat> when you look at the time that an automobile, in making an automobile in North America, I think the components go across a border somewhere, something like 15 or 17 times. This makes it very important to make sure the customs authorities are, are attuned to how to do that expeditiously. Whereas a car coming from Korea or somewhere else only has to cross a border once into North America. So it's, it, in a sense, our border controls that we still have in place and that we haven't completely modernized are, are penalizing the supply chains and the integration of the economy that's developed under NAFTA. Um, you get into such esoteric things as S sanitary and phytosanitary regulations. What about um, carcass washes, for instance, for, uh, for cattle in order to be able to sell them? You know, the European Union has a number of different restrictions on this. Well, we should make sure if we want to have an integrated uh, North American industry or fair competition within North America that we're being treated in the same way on those sorts of things by the Europeans. What about emergency action against imports? We have some rather uh, curious but very effective provisions in the North American Free Trade Agreement on how to do that that really are designed to guarantee that we'll, each NAFTA country will have an incentive to exempt the other from a, a general safeguard action 
And I'm not sure that people are taking account of that as they look at what to negotiate in the, in, in the TPP. Let me just conclude by saying a few things more about the West, because I realize I should, I think a lot of what I've said, of course, is of interest to the West. Obviously, this is a region that looks at, is, is embedded in NAFTA, but is looking at the, at the Pacific region. And I know we're having an energy panel <clears throat> in a few minutes, so I'm not going to say anything about that. But let me talk a little bit about agriculture. And, uh, you know, this is, if you do any reading, this is a, a, an area of enormous projected growth in the world. Uh, there are going to be enormous opportunities for North American producers. Uh, but I think we really need to be thinking, how do we approach this intelligently? And um, in, I, I uh, watched an interview recently with uh, Carl Cassell, the CEO of CHS, the largest cooperative in the United States, which is involved, if you don't know, both in grains and energy business, and um, has revenues of $40 billion. And it was very interesting. He was saying in this interview that he sees a run of at least 10 years on agriculture. The potential is just going to be enormous, driven largely but not only by China. Um, and I think, you know, when you look at this with the dismantling of the Canadian Wheat Board, now there's a, something that our NAFTA partners have been asking us to do a long time, and we've finally done, actually outside the context of a trade agreement. Um, but this is opening up all sorts of new possibilities in terms of how grains trade and, and frankly, feeding of animals might be organized in, in, in North America. Lots of new potential. Uh, interestingly, uh, CHS has uh, bought a Calgary, a, 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 a company called Dynagra, just outside Calgary, which is an agricultural retail company. And um, Casal was saying they've got ideas of going beyond that, that in this interview I mentioned a moment ago, that they're going to be in Canada, he said, they're going to, but they want to make sure they do it properly. They're going to measure twice and cut once. So, you know, I think this is an interesting example of how there's an evolving dynamic for, in the private sector for people to take new advantages of what was negotiated in NAFTA and other new developments that are occurring. Um, I'd also, also like to say something briefly about the the country of origin labeling regulations in the United States, uh, which um, have a, a very adverse effect in trade on uh, swine and cattle products from Canada and Mexico. Um, Canada and Mexico have brought a complaint in the World Trade Organization, which we won. Uh, the United States uh, implemented uh, a replacement measure, which is more discriminatory than the original measure. And of course, we're now in the process of, of looking at compliance panels and we've developed, we in Canada anyway, have developed a retaliation list which we've published to help focus thinking in the United States. We learned these tactics, by the way, from the United States. And a retaliation list that would only be used once the WTO has finally authorized us to do so if the United States by then hasn't seen the light and changed the measure. But my point here is, this is a crazy measure. You know, this is one that is basically ending trade in live animals in North America. And, uh, you know, it's dismantling what was created by NAFTA. And, and there are a lot of big players in the American uh, beef and pork industry that are opposed to it. It basically... Um, doesn't make a lot of sense in an integrated marketplace and is going to cause, in the final analysis, a lot of damage to American interests, even without the retaliation list. Um, well, I think I'll, I'll stop there, and I'm sure there'll be uh, quite a lively discussion period. Thank you very much. Well, my thanks to all the panelists. I want to take the chair's prerogative here, the moderator's prerogative of asking the first question. I'm sure you're going to have things to say to one another, and we will certainly have time for discussion from the floor. But I would just like to see if we can redirect the conversation a bit more toward the West, so the western part of North America, which you certainly all touched on. Um, but let me, again, just remind us all some basic facts of geography. 
It's often said the U.S.-Canadian border is the longest undefended border in the world. That's a little less true than it used to be, thanks to 9-11. Uh, but more than half of that border runs through the western states and provinces. Uh, the U.S.-Mexican border uh, runs through four western states, that's it, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and California. So just from the simple facts of geography, uh, the western United States and western Canada and Mexico all have a very peculiar uh, integrated relationship with one another, and we've touched on that here, but I'd just like to see if we can't focus on it a little more sharply and begin by just asking historically, uh, all three of you who were present at the creation of NAFTA, were there at that time particularly strongly expressed Western points of view, Western Canadian, Western U.S. perspectives on the formation of NAFTA in the first place? And are there, you, John, you identified some, particularly in agricultural areas, we might extend that to forest products, where there are industries uh, that are peculiarly Western in their character or incidents that have a special relationship to this, uh, to the NAFTA uh, agreement. Well, in our, in our case, there were serious regional interests by product, by uh, uh, you know, pr primarily, which is how trade tends to get negotiated and how it tends to be uh, organized in its lobbying and so on. Uh, Jaime mentioned Ron Serini and the multi-fiber agreement. That's an intense issue in the, California, in, the, in the Carolinas. In California, we want to import inexpensive textiles. Um, so this, this, this was constantly an issue of how you put together a coalition to support it um, and what products are going to be dealt with how. Um, but I would say because of agriculture being primarily a Midwest and Western issue in the United States, uh, that was probably the place where it was most vehement. And lest we forget, even, even it's easy California to forget California is here. the largest agricultural country in a state in the United States. Yeah, I was just going to say, even, even, especially here in Silicon Valley, it's easy to forget. But agriculture For, is formerly still Silicon California's, Valley, formerly Mexico, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> agriculture is still California's biggest industry yeah. by dollar volume. I'll tell you two anecdotes that, you know, to make this more fun um, with respect to the West. Um, the, the wine producers... We're very, very upset about the trailerization on wines, and they were putting so much pressure. And I understand that uh, Minister Crosby, uh, who was the first minister of the Canadian delegation to start the negotiations, and then after a few months, wonderful guy, uh, but difficult to negotiate with, because he, the, first, the, the first speech he gave in Mexico when I invited him, he said, you know, in front of a, a thousand entrepreneurs, he said, you know, I come, I come here from, uh, from Newfoundland. He was from the other part, no? Or yes, he was from Newfoundland. From yeah. Newfoundland. And said An island off the east coast of, of Canada. the east coast, so <coughs> he wasn't very concerned with the west. And he said, you know, we organized a, a seminar, uh, and I'm listening to him like this. I mean, he's the minister, and he's saying serious things. I said, we organized a seminar for our space program. <laughs> and, you know, everybody looked at it and said, what is it? So we organized a seminar, and we invited NASA guys to give us their opinion. And then, you know, our expert from Newfoundland put some equations similar to your equations on, on the <laughs> board. And then the guy from NASA says, sir, you realize that if you launch this rocket uh, to the sun? He said, yes, yes, we want to, run, to launch the, the rocket to the sun. And the guy goes, to the sun. He says, well, if you are launching this rocket to the sun, within 45 minutes, it will burn to, it will be burned to, to ashes. And then the Canadian, the, the Newfoundland guy says, well, we're not that dumb. We're launching it overnight. <laughs> 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 so th this guy, so this guy went to visit the owner of Gallo, yeah. you know, to yep. sort of yep. minimize yep. 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 The, the opposition of, uh, of the Californian white producers. And the Mondavis. And as soon as he entered, he said, can I have a whiskey, please? <laughs> 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 so the negotiation didn't go too well. Um, the other one is that I was in the middle of the negotiation and then Senator Lloyd Benson called me and said, you know, we have this idea of creating an ad bank on the border of Mexico and the U.S. And I'm going to get all the Hispanics in California and Hispanic uh, congressmen on board. And I said, Lloyd, you know, to create a bank, come on, it's not that simple. He said, no, no, we'll, we'll put some money behind it. I said, what if we ask the IDB or, or the World Bank to create a special program? 
something a bit less expensive. And he insisted and insisted, so we went for it. So out of 32 boats of Hispanics from California, something like that, we got one. <laughs> a guy from uh, Congressman Torres, <laughs> he voted for NAFTA. The rest voted against NAFTA. We ended up with a bank that, in Spanish, we say a nada bank. Nad Bank, we say Nad Bank because we haven't done much, you know, it's almost nothing. So there were pressures on the regional issues on the West uh, that were very different from the East. But to tell you the truth, I did not let myself negotiate with regions for one very simple reason. Before we started negotiating NAFTA, we were pushing for a fast track authority for the US government to negotiate, which basically means it has nothing to do with the, with the speed of the negotiation. <laughs> But it basically means that the Congress votes yes or no, and they don't get into the details. So if I had opened my, 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 my doors to some regional interest, I would have killed the NAFTA group. And I think that would have, we had to be very careful not to accommodate to those things, because otherwise we wouldn't have had a NAFTA in a long, long time. This is worth, it's worth mentioning that the lack of fast track authority has been a big sure. stumbling block recently. Uh, President Obama's not been anxious to have it, and uh, Congress hasn't been interested in giving it to him, even when he, he ran, the Democrats ran everything. Um, but I can't emphasize enough how important this is. It's difficult to get, but we got it, and it was important. If you are um, going to try to negotiate something where the people you're negotiating with know you're gonna go back to Congress and they can change the details, and you know, an agreement is an agreement to all the pieces and it's carefully balanced and all this sort of stuff. So the notion that, well, you have an agreement except we're gonna change every odd, every odd numbered item uh, to suit our Congress, there, there would never be a negotiation. So it's extremely important. It's, a very, it's an overlooked point that that is tremendously important. John? Let, let me, I, I think something we did in the NAFTA that really addresses the regional issue, but was very important. And that is, you know, we began the negotiations when the uh, two presidents and our prime minister set out a statement, I guess it was in February of 1991, saying it was their intention to enter this negotiation to remove to the maximum extent possible, and I forget, get, you know, it, barriers to goods, services, investment. Uh, it, it was a very short statement, but, but it was clear the ambition was very broad. And um, we then launched the negotiations proper in June of 1991, and, and by the way, you know, they only took 14 months, which by the standard of any other negotiation you're watching today is pretty astonishing. We did get into a side agreement problem later, later. but that had to do with another American election. But, but the actual NAFTA agreement itself <coughs> took 14 months. One thing that made it relatively easy was the fact that we had agreed that there weren't going to be any exceptions to the liberalization, that it was going to be a complete liberalization, at least in the goods area, and a very ambitious set of undertakings in the other areas. So we began with you know, general rules on investment and services, and we would say we would apply these in our relationships and subject only to certain exceptions. Well, the exceptions list got fairly large, but at least then you could see where the remaining barriers were. But to come back to the good side and the tariffs, I remember it was certainly a lot easier to deal with people who came in to the, see the minister or their member of parliament to complain about the fact that you know, their tariff was going to disappear and could you please save us? And and the answer was no. You know, we've agreed to open. to open it up completely. And the only issue where there was some flexibility was in the phasing of the, during which the phase out would take place. Um, so I think that was very important in ensuring that there was a, a, a good attention to all of the products of regional interest, frankly. Uh, the only area where we really fell down badly in Canada was on our uh, dairy and poultry and milk. Uh, products. And, and, which? and milk. And milk. That is dairy. You, you kept it. You, you that kept is it. dairy, yes. <laughs> you kept it close. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, um, but also there was another regional thing that you, did, you didn't put your, your province uh, uh. companies. <laughs> How do you call them? Crown companies? How do you call them? Our, our, yes. How our, do you call them? Our, well, Crown well, in the government procurement part of the agreement, the um, 
we did not put in the NAFTA any uh, uh, purchasing entities controlled by provinces, which included a number of crown well, corporations and provinces. Yes. Yes. So we, 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 we have, we have done this now in the, in the TTIP. I know. I mean, in our CETA with the European really, Union, yeah. which might be a good reason for let me, looking at Let me add one. The uh, NAFTA again. Yeah. Let me add one simple point going forward that when we think of um, the uh, regional issues, your next panel is going to deal with by far the largest and most important, well beyond the trade uh, issues and energy issues from better integration of North American energy and the remarkable uh, abundance, not just from fracking here, but the potential opening up of some of Mexico's resources to foreign investment and greater productivity, and uh, uh, can Al Albertan oil, um, if we're smart enough not to do something that was stupid environmentally, let alone economically, but derail the Keystone Pipeline and so on. This will be the single largest shift in the geopolitical interest of these countries, but especially the United States, to reduce the strategic power of OPEC, which down the road will reemerge very, very strongly unless we develop North American energy because they will become a, a much more powerful marginal supplier uh, sometime 15, 20 years from now if we don't develop all this. Hopefully 50 years from now, we'll much less dependent on oil. <coughs> but the fact of the matter is we desperately need to do this. The stakes are much larger than just our region and it is vital and the, the economic interests are Mexico, Western US, if you include Texas and the Gulf, yeah. generously west of the Mississippi, or yeah. half of the Gulf west of the Mississippi, and, uh, and uh, Western Canada. So yeah. Yeah. kudos to the next panel. We're going to hear more about that in just a moment. But I think now it's uh, time to open this to the floor. And uh, I'll recognize hands as I see them. But please, before you take voice, wait for a <coughs> microphone to reach you. She, she wants to say something. Kathy, right here. Kathy Johnson. Oh, sorry, Kathy. Yeah. You know, I, I feel very ignorant, but I cannot remember exactly which presidential administration NAFTA was approved in. Was it the Kennedy? Was it, it was the signed Obama? overlaps. Signed. Uh, it was negotiated it, and signed by the George H. W. Bush administration. It was. It was George H. W. Bush. It was signed. It was the oh, George Bush. It was negotiated and signed under George H. W. Bush. It was approved by the Senate, as treaties must, under Bill, the first year of the Clinton administration. But the administrations of either president, really, there was no serious objection to the whole idea. Is that right? Oh, yes, oh. there was. <laughs> oh, there was, was plenty. That was my question. There was plenty in the country. There was plenty internally in both administrations. There was. Definitely. And how did you overcome that? Um, well, um, I, from, from personal experience, you use, uh, you use Procedures and tactics that you never thought of as a Stanford professor. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> even, e <laughs> including, I, including with the aforementioned Ron Serini, but um, you know, what normally happens in this thing is you get the most important person, in our case the president, to put his weight behind this, and then you use that to get everybody else to fall in line. I, I, I don't so. think that President Clinton expected that he was going to have to expend so much energy in his first yeah. two years of office of getting <laughs> yeah. NAFTA yeah. and WTO through Congress. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you my view of that as a foreigner. You know, we were watching, first of all, we had to define a very important sequencing issue because we didn't want to approve it in the Mexican Senate, not having an, an idea of how it was going to be, it was going to be approved or not in the U.S because it would have been a pretty disastrous yeah. scenario. So we had to follow things closely. And uh, what President Clinton did was a very smart thing. He postponed his decision quite a bit. He, yes, he, he was a bit of a procrastinator on that one. His wife and his uh, chief of, of, uh, of campaign, a fellow called Mickey Cantor, were against NAFTA. And then he appointed Mickey Cantor to be my counterpart. So the whole thing was a bit complicated. But what happened is that um, as we were approaching the date of the vote in the Senate and in the House, all the congressmen and senators were going back to their home offices. And they were having picketing lines in their offices. 
And if they had made a statement, yes to NAFTA, they were being, you know, attacked by unions and so on. So what President Clinton did the weekend before the vote was to organize a large uh, dinner in the White House so that the congressmen and the senators could not go back to their districts and not change his, their vote. And he did, and he was successful. The very narrow margin, but <coughs> thanks to that dinner on that long weekend in the White House, many of the guys that we had sort of, we thought they were committed to NAFTA, stayed in Washington, thanks to President Clinton for that dinner, and stayed uh, stay with the yes vote. So probably that was the major, con the most important contribution of President Clinton to the negotiation. <laughs> but you, know, you mentioned opposition, and, and it, maybe it's worth just dwelling on that for a moment. I mean, each of you, I think, mentioned protectionism, which is an obvious kind of uh, source of opposition to free trade agreements. But it's broader than that, I think. It's, uh, protectionism is part of a bigger phenomenon of nationalism. Right. And people just don't want to compromise their national freedom of action, their national sovereignty, quite apart from their specific economic interests. So you get Canadian books like Mel Hertig's The Vanishing Country, which are tirades against the whole idea of uh, continental integration. Or Comandante Zero in the Zapatistas in, in Chiapas. Oh, Comandante and, no Zero. And so on. Yeah, well, yeah, you know I know, what I mean. know who you yeah, mean. Yeah. Marcos. Marcos, sorry. As, as somebody. So, in, in Ross Perot, I mean, Ross Perot was not talking just singly uh, about uh, economic interests, but about the whole idea of American freedom of action in the world. So it's a deeper cultural matter. It's not just specifically yeah. economic. I, I think, as somebody who's taught economics for four decades, and who studied this and participated in it, you cannot underestimate how counterintuitive the most basic principle of economic, economics is that two people freely trading together must be better off than if they don't. And people just naturally don't, don't assume if one country is going to gain from it, we'll lose, or somebody else. And it's a very, you, you have to constantly do that. And throughout economic history, from the corn laws in England, et cetera, We've had to fight the battle for free trade over and over and over and over again. Well, and remarkably, it, take, it takes at most a generation for people to forget, and you have to re-educate them again. But in this country, maybe you disagree with this, but it's a big generalization. To me, it's remarkable that the, the senior leadership, the elites in both parties, at the presidential level especially, have been pretty consistent in their support for free trade over several decades. President, Not just NAFTA, but free trade. President Obama. Uh, announced during his campaign he was going to tear up NAFTA. But he hasn't. No, he wisely has he not. He came to He's not, wisely <laughs> has not, but it's kind of startling to hear a leader of a, the United States say he's going to te yeah. tear that up. Yeah, Pat. Yeah. Uh, follow up on that question, uh, given that the panel has varying degrees of gray hair. How are you training the succeeding generation to step in so that perhaps the re-education process that has been referred to about free trade could perhaps be lessened if not avoided? Excellent question. Uh, I'm not doing anything on that front, <laughs> and I should. Uh, but um, not right, I mean, you saw it with our governor, uh, the central bank, and if you see most of the leaders in Mexico on the economic, on economic policy, they are pretty aware of this counterintuitive principle that Michael is saying. So I don't think that Mexico has a danger or is facing a danger in the next years to become protectionist again. I think that the lesson is being learned. The new leaders understand it, the more te technocratic type of leaders. So I, I don't see a, a big risk on that. I do see a risk of, lo of missing opportunities but with the lack of leadership in the three countries, as I was saying, but not going back. I have a slightly different take on that than Jaime. I, I totally agree that it's, there's been, at best, neg neg uh, benign neglect. But I think it's perhaps been beneficial because going back in, something bad might have happened, given uh, you know, how, how things get organized. I, obviously, you disagree with that. But I, I would be nervous that if we went deeply back into NAFTA, we opened up. But I, but I wouldn't go deeply back into NAFTA. I think I would make, you know, I would sev for several people, including our current president, originally wanted to I know, that. I know. But so I think it's a good idea we didn't in that sense. Now, maybe there are, maybe you No, I, I, I fully agree. I mean, well, actually, one thing that, that goes to the issue that you were asking about 
how committed the presidents were, we ended up negotiating side agreements to NAFTA, and we call them side agreements because we, would not, we didn't want to reopen the negotiation. Yeah. So we negotiated with the Bush 41 uh, government, and then when he lost the, the, the election to Clinton, Clinton said, before I send it to Congress, I want stronger rules for environment and labor. I said, well, we are willing to negotiate that, but outside of the text, because if we reopen the text, that's, the, that's, that's it, that's the end of it. So we ended up negotiating side agreements on labor and the environment for a year. It took us a year to negotiate with the American government the side agreements to the NAFTA, but not reopening it. It took them but six months to figure out what they see wanted. what they though. wanted. That was the first part. <laughs> I should, I should quickly add that um, I, I gave some due credit to President Clinton for getting it through Congress, despite the protectionist swing in his party, is, which I think is even larger than the Republican Party. But I think a real hero here, in some sense, is Brian Mulroney, in the sense that um, if you watched um, John's graph of the support for trilateral trade, mm -hmm. We were getting weekly reports in our uh, early morning meetings with the president of, president of Prime Minister Mulroney's approval rating, and they tracked that perfectly. So he had, I think one day, General Scowcroft came in and said some, some quip like it's threatening to get lower than the fraction of Americans who think Elvis is still alive or something. He, <laughs> Mulroney had, had a very, a, a period where his ratings, his approval really was in trouble. And uh, I think a lesser man would have folded. John, you wanted to say something. I want to let uh, George Schultz ask the last question from the floor, but go ahead. Well, I'll go ahead. I'll, I'll pass. Do you agree with that? Well, I, I uh, yeah, I think, I think it, you know, they, I, actually, you know, it was interesting because as I was telling Jaime earlier, actually, the Canadian cabinet had a review of sort of where we were in the NAFTA when we were about two-thirds of the way through the agreement. And it was very interesting, you know, and at a time when clearly in the public opinion polls it wasn't that popular. And, the, and the, the strength of support for it around the cabinet table was quite striking, including one minister I remember who hadn't, whose portfolio wasn't really directly involved in it, who said, if we don't go through with NAFTA, how will, he, how will we explain it to our grandchildren? But... Um, That's great. That's a good one. George. I'd like to sharpen up this discussion by pointing up demography. In all three countries now, fertility is down. In Canada, it's below replacement level. In the United States, it's getting there. Mexico is at replacement level now and probably will go below. In other words, we're going to have a, very, a smaller and smaller labor force for North America. In Canada, the K-12 education system seems to be working well. It's crummy in the United States and even worse in Mexico. So these young people, unless something is done, are not gonna get a good education. They won't be able to do the jobs that are being produced. It also implies that we need to have an immigration system that allows people to roam around and find where they can best make a contribution. So I should think, from the US point of view, we're worrying about the wrong border. The border that is the problem for illegal immigration in the future is, let's call it North America's southern border. And what is Mexico doing about that? And to what degree can the US and Canada help because you want to avoid Mexico becoming a transit country with all the human degradation and corruption that goes with human trafficking. So my question is, in, in the light of the clear demography, what are the prospects for a better education system? And what are the prospects for an immigration system that recognizes clear reality? Gentlemen? I'll, I'll give you the, my view on Mexico. On the education front, we just went through an important reform uh, to, to improve education in Mexico. After many, many years of old Mexicans complaining, the, the most uh, sort of distinguishing factor is that the leader of the union of teachers 
a lady that had been the leader of the union for several years, uh, used to go to Neiman Marcus and spend $3 million every time she was visiting the store. Huge scandal, she's in jail now. The reform went through, but it's something that is gonna take a long, long time. The work I've done relating to economics on that front is that the quality of the education is more relevant to, to, for the increases in productivity than the quantity of years. That's in Mexico. So if you run the productivity of a worker vis-a-vis -vis the number of, the, of years of, of schooling, it has some impact. But if you run it against the results of the PISA test, which is this worldwide test of the quality in math, writing, and so on, it explains much more productivity than the length of the number of years. So this reform is, is main, mainly directed to the quality of education. It's gonna take some years. It's gonna take many years. On the migration front, I already gave you my opinion about labor mobility, but the issue of the border to the south is a complicated issue for Mexico. We have a disaster there. It's a total disaster. So they come in, Guatemala, Belize people, they come into the country literally free, without any obstacle. So if we were to receive by the US for a potential migration reform, the condition that we control the southern border, which you know would make certain sense, I don't think we could deliver that in the short term. It's a total disaster, highly corrupted, very little infrastructure. So that's a pending issue for Mexico, and you are right to sign it. I mean, you are right to, 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 to highlight it because it is a big issue for us, and we don't have control of that. Well, well, you want to say well I'm not going to talk about Mexico's southern border, but we are, <coughs> we are looking at, a, at, northern border. At, at an approach that will uh, have the effect of really in inspecting people before and, and, and goods before they get to North America yeah. so that we can reduce the pressure on, on checking at the Canada-US border. And I think Mexico has embarked on a number of yes. similar things. So yes. there's a complementarity there. And I think all of that needs to be furthered and encouraged and yeah. to the extent possible uh, put on a, a trilateral basis. Conspicuously, the mobility of labor was not part of the NAFTA no. negotiation. There's and some it, elementary provisions. But, they, but the classic uh, formulation in elementary economics is land, labor, and capital make up the elements of production. You'd think in a perfect world there would have been a labor migration clause in the original NAFTA framework, but there's not maybe a something for the next round. Well, had there not been as big an expansion of trade, there would have been probably more labor mobility. Yes, so no, oh, illegal, yeah, yeah, labor yeah, 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 illegal yeah, yeah. migration. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, in, in the interest of keeping us on time, I'm going to declare this session adjourned. But thanks to Michael Boskin and Jaime Serra and John Weeks and all of you. <laughs>